All right, CFA candidates, today we're diving into the world of yields, periodicity, and spread measures. Now, I know it might sound like a mouthful, but trust me, this stuff is key to becoming a bond market maestro. If you've ever wondered why a bond's yield varies depending on how often it pays interest or how to compare bonds with different cash flows, you're in the right place. Grab your pens and let's break this down step by step. So first things first, what the heck is periodicity? Think of it as the number of times a bond pays interest each year. Most bonds don't just pay interest annually. They can pay semi-annually, quarterly, or even monthly. And this affects the bond's yield. Take a five-year bond that pays semi-annual coupons with a stated YTM, yield to maturity, of 3.2%. Since it pays twice a year, the periodicity is 2. You divide that 3.2% by 2, giving you 1.6% per period. Simple, right? But here's the kicker, just knowing the periodic yield isn't enough. We want to know the effective annual rate, EAR, the rate that reflects the annual impact of compounding those periodic payments. When it comes to EAR, the periodicity is always one because we're compounding once a year. If the bond's periodicity is two, semi-annual, we calculate EAR by compounding the semi-annual rate. Now, most bonds out there are on a semi-annual bond basis, meaning they pay interest every six months. The yield calculated this way is called the semi-annual bond equivalent yield. Think of it like a double scoop of ice cream. You get two servings in one year. Remember, the semi-annual bond basis yield and yield per semi-annual period aren't the same. One is annualized the full year's worth, and the other is for each half of the year. All right, now let's talk about converting yields between different periodicities, say from semi-annual to quarterly or monthly. This is super important because bonds can pay interest at different frequencies and we need a common ground to compare them. Here's the general formula to convert an annual percentage rate, APR, from one periodicity to another. Through this formula, we'll learn how to convert an annual percentage rate, or APR, with M periods per year, denoted as APR sub M, to an equivalent APR for N periods per year, which we'll call APR sub N using a general formula that addresses different compounding frequencies. Say it with me, one plus the APR for the first periodicity raised to the power of the number of periods equals one plus the APR for the second periodicity raised to the power of its number of periods. Here's a rule of thumb to keep in mind. More frequent compounding at a lower rate can yield a similar return as less frequent compounding at a higher rate. This is why converting yields between different compounding frequencies is so important. It helps us make apples to apples comparisons between bonds with different cash flow structures. Now let's jump into some other yield measures you'll come across in fixed income analysis. Current yield is a quick and dirty measure. It's the annual coupon payment divided by the bond's price. But remember, it doesn't account for any capital gains or reinvestment of coupons, so take it with a grain of salt. Yield to maturity, YTM. This is the yield assuming you hold the bond until it matures and reinvest all coupon payments at the YTM. It's the gold standard for measuring a bond's return street convention, and true yield. Okay, now most yields are calculated using the street convention, which assumes all coupon payments are made on scheduled dates, ignoring weekends and holidays. The true yield adjusts for actual payment dates, 
resulting in a slightly lower yield due to delays, but it's rarely used. Government equivalent yield. This restates a corporate bond yield using an actual over actual day count to compare it to a government bond yield. It's like converting currencies so you can compare prices properly. Now let's switch gears to bonds with embedded options like callable bonds. A callable bond gives the issuer the right to buy back the bond at predetermined dates and prices, usually after a no-call period. This flexibility is great for the issuer, but not so much for the investor who faces the risk of early redemption. Yield to call YTC. This calculates the yield if the bond is called on the first, second, or any subsequent call date. It's usually lower than the YTM because the investor receives less interest over time. Yield to worst, YTW. The YTW is the lowest possible yield considering all call dates and the YTM. It's a conservative measure, but it gives investors a clear view of the worst case scenario. Let's get into bonds with embedded options, specifically callable bonds. From an investor's point of view, a call option built into a bond isn't exactly ideal. That's because it adds call risk, the chance that the issuer might repay the bond early, especially if interest rates drop, forcing the investor to reinvest at lower rates. Because of this added risk, callable bonds are priced lower than bonds without the option also known as option-free bonds. This price difference gives us the option-adjusted price, which is basically the bond's price after factoring in the call option. Now, when we use that option-adjusted price to calculate yield, we get something called the option-adjusted yield. This yield reflects the market's required rate of return considering the effect of the call option. Since the option makes the bond less valuable, the option adjusted yield is typically lower than what you'd get on a non-callable bond. To break it down, option adjusted price is lower for callable bonds because of the embedded call option. Option adjusted yield takes into account the call options value and is typically lower than the yield on an equivalent non-callable bond. And the value of the call option itself? It's simply the difference between the price of the option-free bond and the callable bond. All right, now we're diving into the world of yield spreads and matrix pricing for fixed rate bonds. Now, if you've ever wondered how to figure out if a bond is a good buy, or if you're getting compensated enough for the risk you're taking, this is your bread and butter. Yield spreads are like the extra toppings on a pizza. They represent the extra return investors demand to take on additional risks over a risk-free benchmark. So let's dig in and see how these spreads work and how you can use them to make savvy investment decisions. Let's start with the basics, yield to maturity. Think of YTM as being split into two slices benchmark rate this is your base layer, the risk-free rate, usually represented by a government bond yield. It's like the crust of your pizza, stable, secure, and usually a given. Yield spread, this is the topping, the extra return demanded by investors to compensate for the specific risk of a bond, such as credit risk, liquidity risk, or even tax implications. The juicier the toppings, the more return you're asking for. Imagine you're looking at a corporate bond from Technova Corporation with a YTM of 5.5%. The government bond, the benchmark, with the same maturity yields 2.5%. The extra 3%, 5.5% minus 2.5% is the yield spread. This is what you're getting paid for taking on Technova's credit risk, 
potential liquidity issues and anything else that makes Technova a little more spicy than a plain government bond. Now, when we talk about benchmark rates, there are two types of government bonds you need to know about, on the run and off the run bonds. On the run bonds are the most recently issued government bonds. They're highly liquid, trade at or near par value, and are like the latest iPhone. Everyone wants them because they're hot off the press. Off the run bonds are older issues that aren't traded as often. They can have slightly higher yields because they're less liquid and have higher financing costs. Think of them as last year's iPhone model. Still good, but not the latest and greatest. So why are we obsessing over yield spreads? Because they help us assess the relative value of bonds. By isolating the yield spread, analysts can focus on the issuer specific risks like the company's creditworthiness without being distracted by broader economic changes. Yield spread analysis helps investors determine if a bond is underpriced a potential bargain or overpriced something to avoid. By comparing a bond's current spread to its historical spreads, you can gauge whether the bond offers good value relative to its own past and similar bonds in the market. If Technova's bond spread historically averages 2%, but it's currently at 3%, this might signal that the market thinks Technova's risk has increased or that the bond is undervalued. Time to dig deeper and see if it's a buying opportunity or a red flag. All right, now let's get into the different types of yield spreads you'll see in bond analysis. G spread. This is the yield spread over a government bond yield, either an actual or interpolated yield. It's like comparing apples to apples, where the apple is the risk of the government bond, and the spread reflects the credit and liquidity risk premium of the corporate bond. It's widely used in markets like the US, UK, and Japan. I spread, interpolated spread, the I spread is the difference between the bond's YTM and the swap rate for the same currency and maturity. It's particularly popular for euro denominated bonds and is useful for comparing fixed rate bonds to floating rate alternatives. If you're holding a euro denominated bond and want to see how it stacks up against the euro interest rate swaps, the I spread is your go to measure. It shows you the extra yield over a standard swap rate. When comparing yields over the benchmark yield curve, we take it up a notch, G spread and I spread. Both these spreads use YTM for discounting the bond's cash flows. However, they don't adjust for when these cash flows occur. Think of them as a broad strokes approach. Zero volatility spread, Z spread, the Z spread is a more precise tool. It's the constant yield spread added to each spot rate on the government yield curve that makes the present value of the bond's cash flows equal its price. It's like threading the needle. It adjusts for the exact timing of cash flows. Suppose you're looking at a bond with multiple cash flows. The Z spread helps you understand the yield spread over the government spot curve, taking into account each cash flow period. It's like getting a detailed map versus a broad overview. Now, what happens when a bond has embedded options, like a callable bond? That's where the option adjusted spread, OAS, comes in. The OAS adjusts the Z spread by factoring in the value of the call option. It reflects the yield spread accounting for future interest rate volatility and gives a more accurate picture of the bond's risk. OAS formula is simple. OAS equals Z spread minus the value of the option. In other words, it's the Z spread adjusted for the potential cost of the bond being called. If Technova's callable bond has a Z spread of 250 basis points, but the option is valued at 50 basis points, the OAS would be 200 basis points. This tells you what you're actually getting after considering the call risk. And there you have it, a crash course in yield spreads for fixed rate bonds and matrix pricing. 
Remember, understanding these spreads helps you see beyond the surface, stripping out macro factors to focus on issuer-specific risks. Whether you're comparing corporate bonds to government bonds, assessing callable bonds, or just looking for a good deal, knowing your spreads is key. So keep practicing, stay sharp, and soon you'll be making informed decisions like a seasoned bond trader. Until next time, keep those calculators warm and your minds even sharper.